You are listening to the cycling podcast at the Giro d'Italia, supported by Science in Sport. Today we are in Sestola. Hello, I'm Lionel Burney. We're without our team captain Richard Moore this week on the Giro d'Italia, but I've been rejoined by Daniel Freed. Hello, Daniel. Welcome back. Buongiorno. Lionel, dove siamo? Well, we're in Sestola, and I know very little about this place, so tell me, what should I know? It's very pretty, isn't it? It's well, chilly it's, as well. It's a beautiful spot. We're high up in the Apennines, the Apennines that straddle in this part of Italy, Tuscany and Emilia-Romagna. It's a fairly uh, modest ski resort um, or winter sports resort. Um, and a pretty small place everyone's clearing up now they've had their 15 minutes of fame but it's been a great day and it was a, a fascinating course today wasn't it it was and talking of fascinating courses uh, we had a wonderful meal last night in Montevarchi didn't we Daniel well, I mean, a great leader might not be here but these <laughs> links are just silky yeah well you know um, I've been very much looking forward to your return because this is my first prolonged experience of the Giro d'Italia for 15 years and I feel I felt a little bit out of my depth. I'm not as au fait with the culture and the way of life and certainly not with the language as I am um, in France. I'm reasonably comfortable in France. I know where places are in relation to one another. It's been a bit of a shambles at times in the first week, but we have muddled through pretty well, I think. Well, I flew in. It was an emergency flight because I'd heard reports of people ordering cappuccinos <laughs> after 11 o'clock and you know, not not using the finest extra virgin olive oil so in I came and I set you right last night didn't I we, we had a, a belting meal in Monte, Montevarchi which is not the most beautiful Tuscan town but we had excellent food pape al pomodoro kind of bread um, tomato oil salad that was fantastic lots of other specialities de- delicacies last night so good time was had by both of us wasn't it? it was uh, yeah I couldn't finish all of mine unfortunately I, I got I, I set out to fast I think and I I didn't leave enough room for the cheese at the end anyway um, let's focus on today's stage it was stage 10 this is the tale of the tapu from Campi Bisenzio to Sestola 219 kilometers in the Apennines run through the headlines of the day the stage was won by a 21 year old Italian riding his first season as a professional Giulio Ciccone of Bardiani CSF that's the first stage win for a non-world tour team at this Giro and Ciccone's first as a professional Bob Jungels took the pink jersey from his Etix quick-step teammate Gianluca Brambilla. And Sky's leader, Mikel Lander, is out of the Giro with a stomach bug. He was dropped quite early on on the stage on the first climb, quickly lost more than six minutes and eventually pulled out. The stage itself was shaped by an 11-man break that included three riders from Bardiani, and they played a blinder, really, and Ciccone went on the penultimate climb, the Pian de Falco, and held on to the finish. Behind the leaders, Andre Amador of Movistar launched a, what looked like a big attack at the time, and he seemed to be gaining a lot of time. Uh, the pink jersey Brambilla was initially dropped, fought back, and then started riding hard for his teammate Jungles. The GC favourites group split in two on the line only by a few seconds but they did close right up to Amador. Brambilla slipped to six overall of the overall kind of contenders although is he really a contender anymore. Tom Dumoulin lost 13 minutes and he said afterwards that if he was making the decision now he'd pull out of the Giro but he's going to sleep on it. So Jungles in pink the first Luxembourg rider since Charlie Gaul in 1959 to lead the Giro. He's 26 seconds ahead of Amador and Valverde is third. Andre Greipel still in red. Damiano Cunigo back in blue and Jungles holds the white jersey but it will be worn by Davide Formolo of Cannondale tomorrow. So that's basically bang up to date with the Giro. It was a day for the spring chickens wasn't it Lionel? Jungle's 24 years old, Ciccone 21. We didn't manage to look up, did we? When yeah, That must be the youngest stage winner for probably decades. And we, we're going to spend our evening, aren't we, researching that. But 21 years old, been a pro for a, a few months. I was chatting to his direct sportive Stefano Zanata um, of CSF Bardiani, or Bardiani CSF at the finish. And he was saying that, you know, this is one of the great merits of that team that, Okay, they don't have a a big budget, of course, a pro-continental Italian team, and they're really forced to throw their young riders in at the deep end. And actually, we were just discussing this today in the car, weren't we, how so few World Tour teams now are willing, certainly at the Tour de France, to throw in their near pros in Grand Tours. And, you know, there's a sort of three or four year apprenticeship. Bardiani really have no choice, and they threw in Ciccone. He's done some big races already this year, Amstel Gold, Trentino, he was very good. 
And, um, you know, good pedigree. He's um, won, well, he's, he's done very well in stages of the Val d'Aosta, the big amateur race in Italy. So, you know, a guy with some talent, clearly, some ability, and what a, an incredible win for him it was today well it was and they pulled it off very well Bardiani and when you look at their recent years in the Giro they've been very successful they won a stage last year with Nicola Bohm they had three stage wins in 2014 uh, Pirazzi and Bataglan were two of those and in 2013 Bataglan won as well so every year of the of the invited teams they are the ones that are really achieving uh, above their station really and today was their Grand National Boat Race Eurovision Song Contest because they are from well the the long time team manager there Bruno Reverberi and his son who um, helps him run the team they're from very close to, well they're from Emilia Romagna which we went through today um, so it, it was a big day for them but you know, they were they were pretty coy I, I was speaking to a couple of guys from their team this morning and they were suggesting that they're only really at the Giro on a wing and a prayer. They didn't really expect to get too much out of either today or any of the stages to come. But as you say, they kind of fired men off down the road and, and played a perfect tactical game. They said uh, apparently in the bus at the start that they wanted to get at least two riders into the group when the move went and they got three, which is obviously better than they hoped. And then they did use their numerical advantage smartly. Um, Perazzi was riding very well. In fact, Perazzi and Cunigo bumped shoulders a bit on the descent and it, that looked a bit uh, a bit sketchy. It was a sketchy old descent back down and uh, before they headed back round and up into Sestola. Um, but yeah, they they played a blinder for a small team they showed what can be done and very topical liner we talked about where the Reverberi family are from they're from Emilia Romagna Giulio Ciccone is one of six I think or it might be seven riders raised in the south of Italy at this Giro and of course we did a kilometre zero last week didn't we on the paucity of cycling talent that there is in the south of Italy and yeah and he's one of the very few well Ciccone grew up watching Marco Pantani he was, he was his hero when Ciccone was a child he said he knows all of the, all of the stages and all of the wins of Pantani and uh, it struck me when I was sitting in the press conferences that you know th- these young riders you know the, the sorts of people that they would have been inspired by are riders that i was covering not even at the start of my career it's making me feel rather old because Bob Jungles you are quite old well I know exactly I mean Bob Jungles is 24 and you know he's he's a generation and a half really after sort of Frank and even Andy Schleck I mean 2007 was the year wasn't it that Andy Schleck won the white jersey in the Giro Um, and and Bob Jungles this is this is the finest performance in the Giro by a Luxembourg rider since since Schleck won that white jersey yeah and he he is another guy with real pedigree, Bob Jungels. I mean, it's taken him a while, certainly, to reach this, you know, these rarefied heights. But he was a guy who, as a junior and as an amateur, really won every kind of race. He won Paris-Roubaix, Espoirs. He won mountain stages. We, we mentioned the, the Val d'Aosta earlier. He won a mountain stage in the Giro della Val d'Aosta. So he could really do everything. And he, he did it all very, very early. He was very, very precocious. And... Um, yeah, he's he's taken his time um, to get to the level he's at now. But you know, last year certainly Trex were very very upset to lose him to Etix Quickstep, and that was quite a contentious transfer at the back end of the summer after the Tour de France. Um, uh, there was a fair bit of sort of animosity created between I think Jungle's entourage and Trek when he he didn't renew his contract with them, but. It, the question really now is how long can he sustain this challenge? I mean, I spoke to Davide Bramati, his Etics Quick Step direct sportif, at the end of today's stage, and he suggested that this is really the, the start of something big. Maybe not in this Giro, but certainly looking forward for to, to future seasons. That Jungels, who's a rider, you know, who is versatile, looked as though he might be very strong in the classics at times, and and then has also done well in in short stage races but this might be the the future direction of his career he might turn into a, a very big name in in the grand tours well yeah on on etics quick step i was just thinking there daniel um etics had a lot of criticism didn't they for the way they didn't uh, really get a big result in the classics and it was almost becoming a bit of a joke um that uh, patrick lefevre would be pulling his hair out every time the etics riders messed up one of the big classics but here in this giro they've been they've been phenomenal i mean a week, a week and a bit ago, Jungels was part of Marcel Kittel's lead-out train, setting Kittel up for two stage wins. 
Brambil has had the pink jersey and I think the spirit within this group certainly was typified by the fact that Brambila was dropped, he fought back on and then without being asked by the team car or even asked by Jungles to pull on the front of the group, Brambila started riding hard to try and ensure that Amador, who was escaping up the road, wouldn't gain the time to deny Etix quick step another day in a pink jersey. You are listening to the Cycling Podcast at the Giro d'Italia, supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fueled by science. Thank you to Science in Sport for supporting the Cycling Podcast during the Giro d'Italia. Uh, if you want to use some Science in Sport products, there's 20% off with the code SIS20. SIS20 if you go to scienceinsport.com. 20% off everything. Um, so thank you for them for supporting the podcast and offering that deal to our listeners. Now the Giro is starting its second week after the, the second rest day and it has now lost its first of the GC contenders. Mikel Land of Team Sky is definitively out of the running. Um, he's had an attack of the... Uh, uh, the the uh, <laughs> <Come on, Lionel. laughs> he's had a he's had a bit of tummy trouble um, overnight and wasn't feeling too good this morning, but decided to start the stage and hope for the best. Um, there was a little uh, moment earlier when uh, people were posting pictures of Team Sky's rest day barbecue, and some of the meat looked a little underdone in that photograph. I must say, but we'll have to find out whether that's played any part in Lander's illness. I suspect not. There's been some rumbles throughout the week that Lander's been suffering a bit, a little bit under the weather. We've lost the first big name. Well, talking of meat, Lionel, I think this might be an opportune <laughs> moment for. Do I hear this. the? Do I hear the music? Le salite determinanti incombevano sul giro e già si profilava una sfida a tre degna di un film di Sergio Leone. The decisive climbs were looming on the horizon of the Giro, as was a three-man battle worthy of a Sergio Leone film. Sergio Leone? Let, let's not get lost in the detail line and what I'm saying here is I think <laughs> my conclusion after today's stage in Sestola with Landa gone is that there are now three riders in contention to win the Giro d'Italia overall. And they are? And they are Vincenzo Nibali, Alejandro Valverde and Rafael Maika. Controversial. Well, that was the latest instalment of The Shark's Tale. Uh, extracts from Vincenzo Nibali's autobiography, read and translated by you, Daniel. That kept us entertained all last week. Read and translated very much on the hoof there. <laughs> that was very much off the top of my head. Yeah, well, you know, uh, often when you go and see a band live, they're a little bit rough around the edges, aren't they? And that adds to the charm, I think. Uh, anyway, Lander is out, and, th- and that leaves Sky... Um, Floundering. Really, yeah, without much of an objective in the Giro. Well, we've been here before, haven't we? We have indeed. I mean, I don't want to slip into the cliched discussions about plans B, C and D, but they came here fully behind Mikel Lander, everyone working for him, and now they will have to redefine what they do in the, in the second half of this race. But you say you don't want to lapse into that cliched discussion. However, Lionel, it is a valid discussion to have, I think, when you look at the grand tour talent that they have in that team and the number of valid leaders or riders who would be valid leaders for other teams and then you consider their position now with Lander gone and they really are bereft and it doesn't really look as though they've got they have any cards to play on general classification and you you do ask yourself whether they they wouldn't be better served keeping someone waiting in the wings in the first week of grand tours you know, just in case, well, for these this kind of eventuality, and, you know, Leopold Koenig, for example, is not here. He was here last year as a plan B. They did have a plan B last year, which worked quite well. But, you know, they got Nieve, Nieve, who was drafted in at the last minute here, Lopez, Nicholas Roach, and the best rider today was actually Sebastian Henau, um, the, the young Colombian rider, cousin of Sergio Henau, the lamented, the, the absent Sergio Henau. Um, and... You know, I spoke to Dario Cioni, the direct sportive, the Sky direct sportive at the finish, and yeah, he seemed actually bereft as far as what the team was going to do from now on was concerned. And I think we can hear from Dario Cioni now. So Dario Cioni, we just saw you congratulating one of your very good performers today, Sebastian Henel, but obviously not a great day for Team Sky with the <laughs> withdrawal of Mikel Lander. Yeah. Let's say the result of the finish is very far away. What we expected this morning and what happened today, big difference. Even for the guys on the road, you know, we came here with one big goal that was to win the Giro with Mikel. Today was that was over, so it's about also 
Refocusing and uh, yes, it's good to Sebastian because even in a hard day like this, he gave it all and he finished with the sort of leader sort of group. So I think good on him that really gave it all on on a day that you could have just sort of uh, pulled out the plug. At what point today did you know that you might have a problem with Mikhail? Was it at breakfast this morning? Did he complain about stomach pains? Yeah, it was this morning when he woke up and uh, after breakfast I sort of uh, crossed him over and he said uh, he hadn't had a great night and uh, had a, a then the doc, uh, you've seen the medical update so I won't elaborate on that. Honestly, we thought it wouldn't be as bad, especially coming from the rest day, but then as soon as we hit the first climb, everyone could see we had a big problem. And you know at that point there's no point even trying to carry on, is that when someone is, is that sick? Uh, Mikel uh, Nieve and, uh, and David Lopez were hit with him, but uh, he couldn't even go up at the sprinter's pace. We, we asked him just to try on the first climb. Maybe the break went early and they sat up. He got back and if it was something like not physical, it could be sort of a bit blocked. But uh, after it was evident, it wasn't going to, to change. And uh, uh, yeah, he was really struggling to hold the wheels on, on the flat, on the, that uh, sprinter's gruppetto, and even on the climb, so we, we decided to call it a day, and David and Mikel made their way back to the uh, sprinter's group. And too early, I presume, to think about plan Bs, both at this Giro for the team and for Mikel for the rest of the season? Yeah, I think uh, with Mikel way too, too early, we still need to see if it is something short-term or longer-term. So that is the medical side. So once we know that from the performance side, we can make a new plan. Obviously in the Giro, uh, GC is over because we had put all the everything one bag or I don't know how you say exactly. So that was our big card, but uh, we still got 10 days of racing. So we must find something new for, for the other guys and uh, we'll have a thing tonight. Lionel, what do you make of that? As I said, Sky really now, they're, they're left scratching around for stage victories or scratching around for some kind of plan. Elia Viviani, is well, he was outside the time limit a couple of days ago and Dario actually said that, um, well, not in that interview, but he, he did say to me that Viviani would have been the most valid sort of plan B now as a stage hunter. They haven't got him. So they're really left with, with Henau. You know, do they pursue sort of... Uh, it's very unlikely that he'll be able to get the white jersey. But Nieve could look for a stage win. He's won stages... Or he's won a stage of the Jura in the Dolomites before. I mean, what do they do? Well, they're now in the same boat as BMC, really, aren't they? Um, although BMC entered the race intentionally without a, a, a leader for the GC. And it's unfortunate for Lander, isn't it? I mean, he was unwell over the winter... Um, he had uh, he was struck down with a virus and his season took a while to get going and then he, he showed some really good results particularly on the climbs he looked really impressive in in uh, in, in April and um, we've really thought particularly after the time trial where he, he didn't lose any time to Nibali or any time of any consequence to Nibali or Valverde he looked really well poised and to, to kind of come down with something over the rest day it just shows you how kind of vulnerable riders are and how vulnerable teams are in Sky's case when everything is is pegged on one man and and like you say they've now got to look at it tonight it would be great to think that they could start firing guys like Ian Boswell up the road and, and give them a taste of a different type of riding because Boswell's come into this race to ride for a GC um, contender Philip Dignan's in the same boat really and he he is someone who's proven um, at Grand Tour level, he could get off and, and, and win a Roach. stage. And I mean, they're, Roach, they're absolutely yeah. stacked with versatile talent. As I said, you know, guys who, you know, perhaps not in Dagenham and a couple of and, and Roach's case necessarily, but you know, they have got riders who would be leaders in in any other team. Well, we'll have to see how they play it. Um, they, they're not they're not that impulsive, are they? You never get the feeling that they're going to have a sort of rah rah team meeting and and really go all guns blazing in the coming days but maybe they'll prove me wrong yeah and lander i suppose questions might be asked justifiably or not about 
Landers preparation for this Giro, he, it was it really reminded me of sort of cramming for exams. He was nowhere near ready a couple of months ago. I think he made his his season's debut this year in late March, didn't he? Seems to get into form very very quickly, but as pretty much anyone who's ridden a bike and and tried to build towards some kind of objective knows, you know, the sh- the, the, the faster you do that, and you can get into form very quickly, but. The, the, sh- the more vulnerable it tends to leave you. Whether that was the case with Lander, I don't know. But he certainly had cobbled something together in time for the Giro del, Tr- del Trentino in, in April, but has come a cropper here. What, what, you want me to pull over? Just in- yeah, just here, just th- this village here what? that we're coming into. Park next to that square over there? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Dove Siamo, Daniel? We're in, Lionel, now that you mention it, a place called Seramazzoni, which no one has talked about, the, the fact that it's on the Giro route this year. No one will probably mention it today. However, about eight or nine years ago, I came here to interview a certain Riccardo Ricò, the infamous, the outlaw of the Giro. And I'm kind of curious to see... Well, I don't think he lives here anymore, or he's spending most of his time in Tenerife, but I'm very curious to see if anyone remembers him, um, how much they know about what he's doing now, and what kind of legacy the Cobra, as the self-styled Cobra, that was his nickname, wasn't it, has left in little Seramazzoni up in the Apennines in Emilia-Romagna. Extraordinary. I mean, loads of people out here this afternoon. Lots of pink banners and balloons that we've seen all along the route. But no rubber Giro. snakes. We haven't seen any cobras, have we? No, no cobras. You just wonder what the atmosphere would be like here if Rico was still racing and, and wasn't sort of exiled from cycling, exiled from the Giro and, and basically retired in disgrace, banned, banned for 12 years. Well, I'll tell you what, should we get out of the car, have a look around, see if we can track someone down who knows where the cobra is hiding? Salve, sì, che meraviglia! Allora, eh, cerchiamo il proprietario, o lei? Eh, lei, voi conoscete Riccardo Ricò? Che vista? No, ho capito, no, perché noi siamo giornalisti qua e sappiamo che abita qua e cerchiamo gente che lo conosca, no? No, no. Capito, perché una volta l'avevo intervistato qua, avevo sì, mangiato. Sì, l'unica volta che è venuto. Ah, capito, grazie. So what did she say there, Daniel? She reckoned that he had one meal in that restaurant in his life and it was with a journalist and she thought it was probably be, it was probably with me a few years ago. I'm not sure what year that was. I think it was about 2007. So she's either got a very good memory or she's lying to us. I think if I were Colombo, I'd say that doesn't ring true. She's obviously covering for something there. He's obviously, he must, they must see him around here, surely. Well, apparently he's left town. Um, he lives in Tenerife. He spends most of his time in Tenerife. But you would think so, yeah. And you would think that, you know, usually you come to villages like this. We're sort of in the middle of the Apennines in Emilia-Romagna. Um, not too much that's very exciting would tend to happen here I don't imagine and you would have thought that people would remember him or have had some contact with him but I guess we need to try somewhere else what about that cafe over the other side all right let's give it a shot no prenderemo un bicchiere no due bicchieri acqua e due caffè Caffè, sì. Ah, non, non si prova. Grazie. Neanche voi, voi non conoscete Riccardo Ricò? Adesso è stato cancellato dal giro. Cioè, nessuno ne vuole più sapere. Sì, sì, sì. Tutto, bro. Sì. Yeah, we used to see him a bit around here. He was an idiot. The house is empty, up for sale. Here, the general opinion is that he was just a donkey, a complete ass. Which is maybe what he is. You're going to give it a go? Give him a ring? Let's try. Uh, hang on it. No so, harm. It's, it says there, Cobra Rico. I'm quite alone. You might answer. His phone's either off or he can't be reached at this moment. He could be in that He could be in that restaurant after. I think he's, in the, at the, he's skulking around at the back of the fridges somewhere. Maybe we should go and have another look. Either that or he's out training. 
see Daniel this is why we've missed you I mean you looked at the road book and you picked out this town and you said let's go there and have a coffee and uh, I would not have known I wouldn't have put two and two together that we were walking in the footsteps of one of the most notorious dopers that the that modern cycling has seen well that is right Lionel that's I'm here to bring you this kind of vital information last night I was telling you about the papal tax in Tuscany which is why they don't have salt in the bread in in Tuscany um, to this day. I think it's, that's lasted several centuries. Um, and this detour that we made today was similar, really. Ricardo, Rico, I recognised a name of a place on, on the route map, Sierra Mazzoni. I'd been there, I think, in 2008. No, it must have been 2009, when he was banned, the first time he was banned. Um, he'd been, well, he tested positive for Chera EPO at the Tour de France and he was serving his ban and I went to interview him up there. He was living there at the time and um, I thought it'd be interesting to go and and, and revisit the, the, the scene of, of our probably long forgotten interview. Um, he, of course, is not living there as we learned in the clip there. He is in Tenerife. He's organising cycling trips, cycling holidays for I don't know how many people I don't know what the uptake's <laughs> been like I can't imagine it's been that great um, but yeah it, it really uh, you know it's a small snapshot it's a small vignette but it really kind of brings into focus the uncomfortable relationship the Giro has with its recent history there are all sorts of people here on the Giro who perhaps not have had the similar experience or the same experience as Rico but have certainly you know they've failed doping test Stefano Garzelli is working here for Italian State Television Rai there are many others like him who have been reintegrated embraced once again um, and Enrico is is a rare pariah a true pariah really a real outlaw um, as far as the Giro is concerned and, and even it seemed when we were up there today in Seramatoni what he did was considered beyond the pale well yeah I mean should just sort of perhaps give a bit of background to Ricardo Rico I mean he was the great prodigy of the of the as we were approaching the, the last part of the last decade he was he was Marco Pantani's successor wasn't he, he modelled himself on Pantani he rode like Pantani or he liked to think he did he was a sensation in the Giro when he uh, won the white jersey here he won two stages of the 2008 Tour de France, which was when he was snared, really, by targeted testing and the biological passport and all of that that was coming in when Anne Gripper was running the UCI's anti-doping department. Rico's fall from grace was, you know, it wasn't so much, he didn't so much hit every branch as on the way down. He fell soundly out of the tree and, and hit, the gr- hit the floor. And although he did come back and he rode briefly with Vacan Soleil, you know, he, his career was really over because... Whereas in the past, Italian riders who had tested positive barely created a, a ripple. This created much more of a wave, didn't it? I mean, it did. And his final fall from grace was so shocking that even the Italians couldn't find it in their hearts to, to embrace him uh, and to welcome him back or to find any kind of chance of redemption for him because you know he, he'd attempted a real DIY sort of uh, British British home stores kind of um, <laughs> blood, blood transfusion. Um <laughs> He'd stored some blood at the back of his fridge and uh, I think it was stored at the wrong temperature and he'd re-injected it and had to be rushed to hospital. In fact, we, we passed at the hospital where... You, you pointed it out. Yeah, we passed the hospital. <laughs> I mean, some kind of... Go- it's like going on a Jack the Ripper tour, yeah, isn't it? <laughs> saved his life in Cavullo. <laughs> and um, yeah, and then I, I gave... Rico Akol, I've spoken to him a few times over the last few years. Um, well, we weren't able to contact him today. Really a, a rider, like you say, who left a very profound mark on the Giro in a very, very short space of time and has now been completely airbrushed, obliterated, cancelled from the Giro's memory. Well, there were, there were always be bad boys in cycling. We know that. You know, there's never going to be a day when it's all... Uh, angelic cherubic faced um, riders and we've seen a little bit of s- m- very mild minor skullduggery in the time trial a couple of days ago didn't we Daniel a Katusha rider an unusual step was taken by the Katusha team to kick one of their own riders out of the race for drafting for too long in the time trial what do you know about this well the rider was Alexei Tsetsevich I'm sure well we, we should we should say that when we do go wrong with pronunciation, and we do often, particularly with the Eastern European names, please tweet us, write to us on Facebook and suggest and, and 
set us right on how we should be pronouncing things. Um, Alexei Satsevich is as good as I'm going to get today. He was thrown out by Katuja yesterday. And as you say, Lionel, a very, very unusual step. I mean, it kind of reminds me, we have seen things like this in football before where the whistle has been blown by... Uh, a team on one of their players having dived in the penalty area, etc. Um, but, you know, there were, there were eyebrows raised. There were some sort of fairly snarky, maybe justified comments about Katuja's image not having been all that great in the past for various reasons, doping scandals, things that they would like to forget. And that by throwing Sasevich out and citing eth- ethical reasons that they were perhaps trying to somehow redeem themselves I don't know if that's true in, in any case you know two wrongs do not make a right and I think they probably should be applauded for taking action on this well you spoke to the Katusha sports director Vyacheslav Ekimov what did he have to say Vyacheslav Ekimov terrifying human being as we all know or, <laughs> um, or has been in the past he was actually very amenable and very affable this evening and he seemed quite keen to sort of set the record straight and really explain in some detail why Tsasevich had been kicked out and he, he explained to me that it wasn't an isolated incident that had occurred in the time trial two days ago. Somebody has to be first, you know, in this, uh, in this decision. Okay, it's a, it's, it's a tough decision, but what I would like to say, he has already a few uh, other things negative, which is obviously probably wasn't seen on, on TV, but it was uh, quite, uh, I would say, uh, uh, have impact on the, on, the, on the image of the team. So we asked him already for a few times, Alexey, you better do something to recuperate these uh, mistakes, you know, to do something. Instead of doing something otherwise, he obviously uh, did this. Uh, for me, it was a fatal mistake. Either you don't, uh, you don't know the rules, okay, or you don't respect the rules. But it's quite, uh, quite uh, difficult to imagine that you don't know the rules, that in the time trial you cannot draft, okay? So that means he was ignoring the rules. And especially when the camera was on your side, and I asked him, what, what do you think the camera was doing on your side? Taking you as a star rider or what? Then we also hear face something that is completely not respect of the rules, of the team image, and uh, just, you know, the position is more than strange. And we don't need this rider here in the race. And you said this isn't the first time that he's done things that have maybe damaged the image of the team. What Of what nature have they been? Have they, his behaviour in the peloton, for example? No, I don't want to go this over the small details. Mm. These details, uh, it's obviously very seen for the team, for the, for the sport director, for the management. But, uh, you know, he doesn't appreciate those things like impact on the image. So and simply, probably, he doesn't get it. What is, the, what is the right things or what is the wrong things to do? So that's why I told them, listen, we, uh, we send you home, you relax, open the rules of the ECI, read it, study it, try to get yourself to the point that was wrong, what was wrong in your, in your behavior. When you calm down, we come back to the issue of uh, being participating in a race, and then we talk. Is his future on the team in danger? I don't know. It, it depends on him, you know. I mean, he's a good rider, he's still a good rider, he's still a promising rider, but we never put ability of the rider in the front of uh, team spirit, team feelings. We, know, we, we will never do this. So he probably better uh, find other team, if some team will appreciate this kind of uh, negative side in the rider, or he has to change completely uh, his, his approach and continue going with Katusha. Eurosport, the home of cycling. Thank you very much to Eurosport for sponsoring the cycling podcast. Uh, They're helping us to be here at the Giro d'Italia. You can watch their coverage every day on television, of course, with uh, Rob Hatch and Sean Kelly. And they are heavily behind the Pedalo de Charme Award. Now, while Richard is at home, just to make him feel part of the show, um, while he's back in London for a week recharging his batteries, uh, we... We allowed him to nominate the Pedaleur de Charme. Why? Why? Well, he, he wants to stitch us up in some way by making, uh, making us award T-shirts to riders who are inaccessible or um, you know, who aren't going to take it in the spirit that it's intended, perhaps. But let's see who he's chosen today. For young Giulio Ciccone, as Brambilla loses pink. Yes, Brambilla loses pink. Hello, everybody. It's Richard Murray here back in London watching... Eurosport, of course, watching the Giro on Eurosport until I return to Italy next week. And it's my job this week to announce every day's Peddler de Charme, the competition 
supported by Eurosport. Thank you very much to them for their sponsorship of the Cycling Podcast. And the Pedal de Charme Award today goes to Gianluca Brambilla, who a few of you nominated. Technically, he's won it already, but we haven't managed to get a T-shirt to him. So I am asking Daniel and Lionel to do their level best to get a T-shirt to Gianluca Brambilla tomorrow. It will be more than ample consolation, I'm sure, for losing the pink jersey. Over to you, chaps. So, well, Rich has obviously canvassed opinions on Twitter and Facebook and what have you and and has uh, given it to Gianluca Brambilla. Um, controversial second time winner I'm not sure that's allowed but uh, he did ride very charmingly today has to be said he did although I think we should restore the original spirit of the Peddler de Charm jersey which it was all about it was about kind of things that had gone unnoticed in the day wasn't it it was about things we'd seen at the start someone being particularly chivalrous for how, example how do, how do we how do we notice things that have gone unnoticed well i think we need to cut more adrift and i think that we need to take charge of this again <laughs> well if you're listening richard you're going to have to take this up with daniel um we'll, we'll we'll stick with it for a couple of days we'll give it another couple of days shall we well, just just on <laughs> inaccessible riders as well i think ilno zakarin has certainly gained an image or the reputation of being quite inaccessible again you know it's, it's an interesting question about Katusha's image and the, what they did yesterday with Satsevich and they, they there have been various noises from that team throughout the year about trying to project a, a different image a friendlier cuddlier image um, and Zakarin is not a great poster boy for that because I don't know if you saw the other day Lionel was a, an interview I can't remember on which website but with one of our Spanish colleagues Fran Reyes had tried to interview Zakarin and Katuja insisted on a translator being there or the, or the team press officer. And really, he's, you know, I, I talked earlier about a three-horse race between Valverde, Nibali and Micah. He's a real joker in the pack, isn't he? He's a real unknown quantity. And I don't think it would really surprise any of us if he emerged and, and really cut a sway through those three names and, and ended up on top of the podium because he's accustomed us in the last two years to the unexpected really well yeah but Richard made the point a couple of days ago you know he's, he was pretty bashed up by the crashes in the time trial and Richard asked the question over dinner one night when was the last time a rider won a Grand Tour having had a, a, a serious crash you know and we couldn't think of anyone I mean that's one of the things about it isn't it staying upright and not not getting bumps bruises and knocks um, and having to recover and all of the things that 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 brings with it even if they're only relatively minor they, it, the toll takes adds up over the days and this is while we wait for uh, a Vespa to pull away and no doubt <laughs> completely ruin the sound quality of our podcast and this is one of the really remarkable things about Vincenzo Nibali that I've mentioned before I think Vincenzo Nibali has finished something like it might be 15 or 17 Grand Tours. The only Grand Tour that he has not finished was the Vuelta a España last year when he was disqualified. And that just bears out your point, Lionel. I mean, Nibali has crashed occasionally in Grand Tours, but generally speaking, he's picked his way through all the danger on the road and he's avoided crashes or he's avoided illnesses. Exactly. You know, today we saw another thing that dictates success or failure in Grand Tours. It's the ability to avoid illness. And, you know, I think that really explains why, in spite of not having fantastic form, in spite of not appearing to be very well prepared, everyone kind of in the know, everyone who really follows professional cycling closely that we've spoken to on this Giro has said Nibali is still the favourite. Well, we'll see over the coming days, won't we? I mean, the GC battle will probably take a little bit of a backseat over the next couple of days. Certainly will on Thursday. It's as flat as a pancake that day. Um, Before we wrap up, Daniel, any other business from your first day you've, you've hit the ground running today that's for sure on your return to the Giro oh, that's very kind of you to say oh, Lionel. Yeah. Um, I mean I've done all the driving but uh, you've hit the <laughs> ground running <laughs> at the at the start this morning in Campi Bicentio which is kind of a slightly scruffy suburb of Florence did bump into one familiar face Cal Crutchlow not a cyclist but a MotoGP rider uh, he's a MotoGP. Do you call them pilots or riders? I'm not really into my motorsport. It's quite kind of embarrassing because I know Cal relatively well now. I've, I've met him a couple of times. 
and I never really know how to address him and I never really it, it's very very obvious to him that I know nothing about what he does of course he's a, he's a world star but um, and, and he's a good friend of Mark Cavendish isn't he and he does an awful lot of cycling himself almost enough to be a pro you were telling me today well he does and then we're going to hear from Cal in a minute he's talking about just how much cycling he does do but um, he's riding this year for LCR Honda I think the team is they're not here at the Giro d'Italia that's a MotoGP <laughs> team and of course later this week later this week he has got the Italian Grand Prix a huge a huge um, showcase I'm, I'm told in the MotoGP calendar I was actually there last year with Mark Cavendish but he's got that Cal coming up at the weekend so he's going to be turning his attention to that later in the week in the meantime I saw him this morning in Campi Bicenzio and I had a quick chat with him about all matters Giro d'Italia no great to be here good to good to come to the Giro um, I have a house not too far away so it was really nice to to be able to come I have many friends riding in the in the race um, but yeah yeah looking forward to, to watching it it's been interesting so far and um, be good to, to go up to the local climb today and, and sit on it and watch the guys come through. Your partner in crime or your training partner, Mark Cavendish, is not here. He's off enjoying himself in California. Um, and it wouldn't have been a stage for him, would it, today, Cal? I mean, you know these roads a little bit. It, it's tough and it's gnarly, isn't it, today? Yeah, it's a tough It's a tough day. Um, but, yeah, Cavs are obviously over in California uh, doing well and ripping it over there. But you never know with him. Sometimes you might be able to stay on these climbs and, and finish with, with a group if you really wanted to. So, um, But yeah, obviously a good, a good friend of mine. We train a lot around here. I'm um, also back in the Isle of Man. But yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be a difficult stage today, but great to watch, I think. And like a lot of MotoGP pilots, you are very interested in cycling. You ride a lot yourself. What are you making of the Giro so far? Are you watching much of it? A funny story, I had my house ro- uh, robbed not so long ago, so they stole all the TVs. Uh, but I've been keeping up to date on Twitter and, you know, obviously what, uh, come to watch this stage today. Um, but yeah, it's great to see. It's good to see some guys on the attack and good to see uh, Brambilla the other day, you know, to keep the jersey in the, in the time trial because it didn't look like he, he had that sort of strength to be able to do it. But it's amazing what adrenaline and, and something, you know, your goal can do at the end of the end of the day and end of the stage. So it's going to be interesting. I can't see too many riders beating Nibali overall, though, in the end. Maybe just find his legs in the first week and second and third week probably come strong. And you're in the middle of your season, Cal, the MotoGP season. This time of year, how much time do you get to ride your bike and how much do you do generally a year? How many kilometres? Probably around 25,000k I get to ride. Uh, as soon as the MotoGP stops, I start to ride my bike, you know, on a Monday or especially in the off-season, I managed to get a good six or 7,000 kilometres in the two months we have off. And then I just keep ticking over, but I love it. It's my passion. It's If I could a couple of years ago, I would have tried to change, but now I'm too old and just, you know, everything's going quite good in MotoGP. I'd probably ride way too much. Probably ride probably more than a lot of the pros. Um, but I'm, a, I'm not at a bad level, but I know what it's like when you when you jump into some of these races with these guys and when they do finally do an effort and that, it's a lot harder than what it seems looking on the TV. This time last year I saw you with Mark Cavendish and he was rating your prospects um, as a professional bike rider. He was suggesting that you might be able to stick with the peloton, you would never win a race. How would you rate his prospects as a MotoGP rider? Because I understand he's getting more and more interested. Oh yeah, he loves it. You know, he, We're really good friends and, and he, wants to, he wants to ride the motorbike all the time. And he wants to be a MotoGP racer and I want to race uh, the Tour. or So it works out perfectly. But I don't know. I think I've got a better chance of winning a, a bicycle race than what he has uh, a MotoGP race. But he, he's definitely good on a, on a motorbike. There's no doubt about that. He went with a friend last year in South Africa and rode. He's got the skills. You know, you see him uh, on, on the bicycle. He goes for gaps that are not there. He's able to, to control a bike. And he's exactly the same with the, with the motorcycle. But I think... He's probably just a little bit too old to start racing the motorbike now. Well, if I wasn't getting so chilly, Daniel, I'd make a joke about motors in bikes here at the Giro, but um, I can't actually think of one. The the listeners will have to fill in the gaps there. It it has got a bit chilly here, hasn't it? It has, but I was just about to say, Cal always, Cal Crutchlow, always comes into his own around this time of year because last year, I remember, I saw him and spoke to him at exactly the time when Team Sky had introduced the motorhomes. They had a motorhome at the Giro d'Italia, and motorhomes are very much fixtures of the 
the MotoGP furniture, all the riders stay in them. And this year, of course, we've got the Moto motorized. What, what did Kaylee Fretz, our colleague, call called it? Motorized, motorized cheating. cheating. Yeah. We've got that yeah. debate rumbling or rumours of, of that going on in the background. So, you know, maybe next time we catch up with Cal, we should get his um, get his opinions on that. But very interesting, wasn't it? That to hear him say that he considered giving up MotoGP a couple of years ago to become a professional cyclist and only half joking really well yeah it's probably left it a little bit too late now but um, you know and, and riding 25,000 kilometres yeah, a year I mean that's all new line isn't it? And, that, and, that is, and as Cal said I think that's probably more than a fair few pros I mean you know we, we do hear occasionally about riders who don't actually like cycling and don't actually <laughs> like riding their bikes. I mean, Chiro's always telling us that Nibali doesn't like riding his bike. Well, he's riding his bike quite well in this Giro, isn't he, to be fair to him. Well, let's uh, wrap it up there, Daniel, because it is getting chilly. It's quite high up here. I wasn't I wasn't prepared for it to be... A thousand metres. Is it a thousand metres? Yeah. It's, uh, and it, the, the sun, unfortunately, we're not sitting in the sun. The sun is kind of dappling on the buildings over there. It looks really, really attractive, isn't it, up, up here? Um, very nice little spot. Um, but tomorrow morning, we better, we better get on the road tonight because tomorrow morning we've got a, a, a guided tour of the Maserati factory. Big thanks to Maserati UK for uh, lending us a car to get us around the Giro d'Italia. Um, we'll be taking it home to... Uh, well, home to its its place of origin, I suppose. And this evening, hopefully, we've got a very fine guided tour of a restaurant menu, of, a, of an extremely good restaurant menu. Um, Emilia Romagna, we will be in Emilia Romagna, that's where we're staying. Very famous for its food, probably the, the best gastronomic region in Italy. Well, we better get a move on because it's an hour on something drive to our hotel, so let's hit the road. Uh, Daniel, thank you very much. Thank you, Lionel. And... Uh, Thank you very much, listeners. We'll see you again tomorrow.